everyone, and thanks again for joining us. I hope you had a fab time networking. Um, we have some really incredible people joining us from all over the world, different industries, from pharmaceutical industry to engineers, academics, consultants, small business owners, um, people in government, in policy, creatives. Uh, musicians so really we know that whether you are a dog lover or a baker or a musician whatever you're doing wherever you're from there are some really cool people here today and we're really excited because this is the time that we talk about a world without borders we've got a very special session planned for you but to make you feel special and to really start this off we have a special performer joining us. So I'd like to say a little bit about him. I might look at my notes a bit here because I want to make sure I don't miss anything special. So we're going to be joined now by our Kenyan-born multi-instrumentalist singer and songwriter, Rapasa, who is exploring Northern shores and he will bless us with his wise stories and his music. He uses a very special instrument, an eight-string lyre, and he will talk about his culture and his country and we will explore a very special journey with him now. So without waiting too long, I'd like to welcome to our stage a very special performer, Rapasa. <laughs> I'm not 
This song is called Kwithe. Unai Kwithe is the phrase we normally say when we want to do storytelling. of you. I'm not uh, physically there, but uh, I'm playing an instrument called Nyatiti from Western Kenya. And um, I'm going to play a second number, um, which is one of the tunes that I've been writing at uh, my residency as artist um, and that has been happening at Sage um, Get Set here in Newcastle. I'm going to play a song called uh, Oya Utich. <laughs> Thank you. 
I'm going to play my last tune. It's called uh, Don Cosevillo. Thank you. I hope you guys are enjoying. And uh, let's get on to Don Cosevillo. Yo fui 
My show next um, in May 28th. I'll play at the Globe. Uh, Globe will be live streamed, and uh, uh, I'll be launching my work um, around uh, 29 uh, around um, 19th of um, of June. So, Karibu Sana. Thank you. Hi. What a lovely performance all the way from East Africa, Kenya, and it was just so beautiful. The songs, the instruments and everything, it just sounded so harmonious and I'm just, I'm just in awe of everything. Absolutely, that was beautiful. And to hear how people listening and watching were really enjoying that, right? Mm, yes, we are. It's really special to see uh, new audiences connecting with different music and mm. cultures. And that's part of what today's Imagine a World was about, right, Fajira? Yes, it really was. And um, it's just so interesting to see people from different, like, diversity and different backgrounds just coming together and then just interacting with each other. It's just something that's really, really, really amazing. And I think it's so cool that we're all here doing that. Exactly. And it's been really special, I think, today to have mm. this opportunity to learn from each other, but to hear um, different perspectives and new ideas and we're going to have actually a very special session now mm. it's an in conversation with so we have two very special vip guests which we'll tell you a, a little bit about in a moment but just to chat quickly Fajira, about you know you're currently the president of tedx newcastle yes, uni so, yeah. i was the president of tedx newcastle uni the society so you know what does for, for instance we're going to be talking a little bit in this session now about democracy and mm. sharing ideas and finding common ground. I'm just curious, what does democracy mean to you? Um, that's a good question. Um, for me, democracy is everybody having their own say and being allowed to have their own say, so everyone having a voice and the voice being not only just being said, but also being listened to for those we put in power because we it's our votes that are needed to get you there. So you should listen to what we have to say in order to better the society as a whole. It's also a place where there's not only equality, but there's also equity for all, regardless of gender or race because we're all living together in a society and it should be the country, should be for everybody and not for, you know, uh, some people. And it's just something that I just feel like we need to progress as a community. We can always be better at it. And it's just very interesting to have this conversation to see how we can progress in that manner. Absolutely. Thank mm -hmm. you so much for sharing that. And I think as well, just to add to that, we can learn so much from hearing each other's stories, but voices and also, you know, using our voice to amplify others and open doors for others, which I think is really important. So without uh, us chatting too long, since we have very special guests to bring to you, we would like to tell you a little bit about our special guests this afternoon. So this next bit is going to be a special in conversation with 
uh, Reverend Professor Keith McGee and Professor Richard Clay. Would you like to tell us about Reverend Professor Keith McGee? Of course, um, I'm going to look at my notes here a bit, but yes, Reverend Professor Keith McGee is a trained economist and theologian, and he's currently Chair and Professor of Practice in Social Justice at Newcastle University here, um, and the lead pastor at the Berka Church. Um, he, one of his greatest accomplishments is serving for five years as a founding director of the National Public Housing Museum in Chicago, which is something that's very, very cool. Um, living he's committed to being living a cultural experience on social justice on human rights and eliminating the power of um, balance and so he's also um, Dix Lessig so one of his most significant accomplishments is as co-creator of the multicultural initiative at Yale University Center um, for Dix Lessig and creativity he's done so much work for, on there and it's just so great to see somebody from that neurodivergent spectrum just coming to teach um, talk to us about that um, where like we said before we're all inclusive so this is something that we should honestly pay attention to as a global community as well and then we also have another speaker that Ashley will talk to us about. Sure, and we are joined as well by Professor uh, Richard Clay, who is a professor of digital cultures at Newcastle University mm. in our School of Arts and Cultures. So we're delighted to have him here. Um, Professor Clay's research is uh, really around exploring so many different mediums of art from graffiti and uh, you know politics and history to contemporary jewelry how we interact with different pieces of art um, you know documentary footage um, it's really multifaceted and so we're really excited here to talk not only about social justice but about democracy about what ordinary citizens can do mm. to make a difference in their communities so without further ado we are delighted to bring to you our very special guests they are joining us now and if we can welcome them to the stage so imagine a world yeah, it's a beautiful title imagine a world where people are finding common ground to deal with the unbelievable challenges that humanity faces at the moment so I think my headline question is, what are those challenges? My old friend, Keith McGee. My, my dear friend and brother, uh, Richard Clay, those challenges certainly first are COVID-19, um, of course, poverty, uh, climate change, hunger, racism, sexism, uh, what's going on with our lands, uh, hunger, uh, xenophobia. I mean, we could go down the list those are our challenges. Those are the things that need to be uh, addressed. And, and yet these are challenges that are common pretty much across the world. They're common. And I think part of the commonality is that it is about what democracy is supposed to look like. And the fact that when democracy is really within the hands of the people, the people can control the narrative or at least speak more broadly about the narrative. And so that's our, that's, that's our challenge, that we need to find this place of common ground where all citizens, no matter what country, land, soil that they live on, understand that power really belongs in the hands of the people. And how do we get there becomes our real challenge for us and where we will find our solutions, I believe. Yeah, you, you're sure right about those challenges. Uh, I was reading this week the National Intelligence Council's four yearly um, global trends report, often very insightful, you know, coming out of the US intelligence communities about the kinds of challenges we face globally. And I hear what you're saying about the importance of empowering people to feel the commitment to government. But what the report suggests is that people globally don't feel that way, that people are increasingly disillusioned with government, feel that government isn't listening to them, and that they feel pessimistic about the future. So how are we going to go about dealing with that? Because that seems to me the fundamental challenge, that we can't fix the world if people feel disempowered to address these challenges. We've got to, we've got to get to the people. We have to find the means to getting to the people, which I think are available to us. We live in this very global reality where people are connected through social media. I think we have to take, as, as you know, we've discussed, and transform how people are thinking and feeling in spaces through what's immediately available to us. How do we take what's in our hands, our smartphones, these devices, and use them to build a sense of common ground and common good? 
I'm so with you, but you know, the, the smartphone thing, um, you know, it's like 15 years now since I started to say to people, I've got more computing power in my hand than NASA had to send people to the moon. You know, this is an incredibly empowering device. But on the other hand, uh, this technology and, you know, the social media revolution that we're living in uh, is also part of the problem, surely. It's, you know, we've got these algorithms and these interfaces that are designed to make to take advantage of our behavioral psychology and to, to encourage us to listen to people who think the same as us. And there's this real risk that we're all ending up in filter bubbles. I mean, I think there's great hope, but there are great risks as well with this technology. I completely agree with you. And so the eternal optimist that I am, I believe that here's the opportunity to take something that is not used, I think, to its maximum capacity to build alliances, to build common ground. I think this is a real opportunity for us to actually determine how we can journey together as opposed to apart. I believe that if social media could just begin to interface with what is common good? What is common sense? What is common meaning? What does it mean to be democracy? If we could take and shift the narrative rather than you know the false narrative of my new handbag that I couldn't afford in the first place, you know, how do we shift the narrative and get to the place where people are using this for good? And and I, and you're right. I mean, what social media has and these smart devices. I have too many around me now, right? what they should be done be, be used for is the smart things right there there's this there's this object failure in how we see ourselves and how we see society but i think that there's an amazing opportunity here and that opportunity is how do we now take these mediums to build alliances how do I share my experience in London with someone, uh, you know, in 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 uh, Karen, um, uh, Kenya? How do I like use this opportunity to really build the alliances and have uh, my knowledge shared with people who are struggling with environmental justice or social justice? How do I do that in that space? I think that that is underutilized, and I think we have an incredible opportunity there. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, this could be a bit of a boring conversation because it's two people agreeing with each other all the time, but it's often like that with you and I, I found. I'd just like to reassure anyone who is a handbag manufacturer that we're not anti-handbags. We think handbags could be part of the solution and not just part of the problem. Right. However, uh, look, and I think that one of the surprising things for me is with the online revolution, and, you know, and I am clued up about what's going on out there online, and I follow traditional media, and yet I hear so little of the good news of what is actually going on globally. And you know, in terms of meeting these global challenges, I'm surprised that I so rarely come across talk about um, what I think is a wave of you know of a new kind of democratic engagement that's going on. You know, deliberative democracy. You know, the UN. A democracy funds report, uh, which has the dullest title ever about enabling national initiatives and blah, 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 blah. But it's basically about deliberative economy or the OECD report on catching the deliberative wave. These show that there are really, really important initiatives that are going on, have been going on for some time and are gathering pace and they're going on all the way across the world. And I'm talking about you know, citizens assemblies where you get a randomly selected but demographically representative body of 100 citizens, whether to deal with an issue that might be local or national or international, and you give them the time, you give them the space over several months to hear from experts and to deliberate, which is to say to listen and to consider and not just to shout at each other. And they will find solutions to intractable problems. You know, you look at Ireland a couple of years ago, doing its deliberative assemblies on um, gay rights and on abortion. And these were issues that have been really divisive in this predominantly Catholic country for years. And the citizens gather and the citizens give solutions to politicians and policymakers who had promised they would listen. And it leads to referenda. And the referendums result in gay rights, gay marriage, and, and the legalization of abortion. And they just show what happens. 
Right. And, and so, so I imagine a world <laughs> where we take global issues and we do a global citizens assembly where we come together as an international uh, people who understand that in a few generations, we're going to be talking about what does global democracy look like? How do we now begin those conversations? And I think it, it's critical. I, you know, there are certainly spaces where it's happening, so we don't want to negate that it's not happening anyplace. But how do we really begin back to social media to engage people around the globe in these issues that are important to all of us? And how do we see ourselves uh, as responsible for one another? You know, you know, Michael Sandel deals with all of this stuff, you know, in, in his uh uh, the, uh, ideal around the common good and the tyranny of merit, but how do how do how do we realize that we're all in it together, as opposed to the ideal of just the elite surviving this authoritarian kinds of construct? How do we come together, realizing I am responsible? You know, in in my faith tradition, talking about being my brother's keeper. How do I realize I'm my brother's keeper? How do I understand that? You know, uh, in in addition to the ideal of the Shema Israel, that that I'm to love my neighbor as myself. How do I get to that place? I think that that is critical as we find the right strategies to move forward. How do we see the other as ourselves? Where's the mirror? I think if we don't follow some of that advice and, and rise to some of those challenges, we do face a really serious um, collapse in faith in democracy. And that's what my concern is that the legitimacy of democracy lies in the fact that elected representatives can say, well, I represent the will of the people because I was voted for. But if you look at voter turnout, turnouts below national election level internationally, they're, they're extremely small. And it becomes very difficult for politicians to claim that they legitimately represent the will of the people when less than half of the people have voted and less than half of those have voted for the politicians. So for me, it has to be about empowering. Uh, the deliberative democracy, the, the citizens' assemblies, the citizens' juries, and embedding that into local as well as national, and as you've suggested, even international politics. And I agree. And, and, and the question perhaps for us should be, what does it mean to be a citizen? Maybe that's our starting conversation. You know, when, when I was, as an American in, in high school, you know, graduated in 1986, we were required to take American civics to graduate high school. 37 states in the United States no longer teach American civics. So we're not teaching individuals what it means to be a citizen. So we're not, in, we're not teaching them how to be engaged in the political process. So how do we talk about what it means to be a citizen? and how to engage ourselves in every sense of the formation of a society. I think that that is very critical. And that is one of the ways that we find common ground. We're all citizens of the world. How do we realize that? And how do we take responsibility for that? And I, I think that, you know, I don't want to get anybody in trouble, but, you know, I think that everyone in the United States Congress should be sent home. I think we should start over, uh, you know, you know, in most governments, I think we should start over and say, you know what, you failed us. Here's where we are. Look at our deficits. Look at what's happening with racism and policing and uh, gender inequality. Look at what, what has happened with our environment. You've been here. If you were here when any of these things happened, we invite you to go home. And the people then become engaged in the process. I mean, it's really not that simple. I wish it was. But how do we begin to transform government and to transform people into understanding that within a democracy, the power is to be invested in the people? Yeah, well, I'm with you. I mean, the Fox Populi, Vox Day, the voice of the people is the voice of God, and politicians should be listening. You know, I'm a godless man, but you know, should be listening to the people first and foremost. I would rather that um, Congress remain seated, uh, but I want them to run citizens' assemblies and to do that with a, a, a clear commitment to listen to what is found when they listen to representative bodies of citizens who have had chance to deliberate and to consider and to reflect. 
and, and to do so knowing that their recommendations are going to be taken seriously. And I think politicians would hear some really, un, some really surprising things if they listen to those kinds of deliberative assemblies. I think the wisdom of communities would come out. And I think communities that appear divided on some levels, so many levels, when they actually had a chance to sit and talk and to ponder and to hear from experts, they would find common ground and they would find solutions. Well, well I do know that there are some uh, politicians, both here in, in the UK and in the United States, who have these town forums and these spaces to hear. My concern is, were they listening or were they hearing the people? And if they were, can they say that they've adequately responded to the needs of the people as the people have addressed them? Or are they responding to the needs of the people as they think they should be addressed? There's those, that's very different. So to your point, the Citizens Assembly is very critical and important to any developed society, any underdeveloped society. I think it is really critical that we move there and we move there swiftly for, for the state and the sake of the world and of humanity. Yeah, and it would also be very good for politicians. I mean, imagine being a polit politician, you could say, yeah, this policy that I am championing, this came from the people. And this is championed by these hundreds of people who've been involved in these citizens' assemblies. Then they would no longer be politicians. Well, they'd be they, servant, would, they, they would be, be servants of the people. Exactly. <laughs> so you know what? I think my question is for both of us now, all right, that's all interesting. I think it's fascinating. I think it's incredibly exciting to, to, to realize the level of engagement that is going on out there around issues like the deliberative democracy movement, you know, and that it is being taken very seriously by organizations from national government level to international government down to local government level. You know, that's promising, super promising. But what do we want the people who are listening today, who are part of the movement towards good, who are definitely interested in imagining a new kind of world, who come from all over the world, what are we asking of them? Well, I would say uh, it, it draws me back to uh, Howard Thurman, who was a theologian uh, and philosopher. In 1971, he actually wrote about the search for common ground. And Thurman believed in a twofold journey, self-exploration, yeah, and the building of community. And that the blending of those two were more compelling than all of our faiths, fears, concepts, ideologies, that if we could go on a personal exploration, and then build community from that with wanting the best for the other, we could get there. And so how do, how do we, the people, a part of this conversation that will hear this conversation say, what is my responsibility to my brother, my sister, to the other, to the person most unlike me? And how do I take and build community, beloved community on that? I think that brings us to the place of common ground. Whereas uh, what I would like to see is that plus. I'd love it if people were to go on the kind of journey I've been on around deliberative uh, democracy. And uh, I know some of my friends have been on and family have been on as a result, that we start to think about this stuff. They all go off and read about it. They start to Google around the UN uh, Democracy Fund, the OECD, catching the deliberative wave report and then finding out about all of the groups that are working in these spaces internationally, locally and uh, nationally, and then talking to our friends and our peers about it and our family members and urging them to do the same. So whereas you think of Thurman at this point, I think of my mum because when I was a teenager, she told me, Richard, if you want to change the world, change the mind of the person in front and the person behind and ask them to do the same. And she didn't have social media. So imagine what could be done if we all engaged and we all talked to our peers, our friends, our families, and moved forward. And we're ready to catch the wave. What a noted philosopher. 
Yeah. Right. <laughs> so, Indeed. so she's right. She's right. That's what, that's what happens. That self-exploration, that taking the person behind you and in front of you and just sharing that one thing, you know, uh, be the one kind of uh, campaign, right? Be the one to bring about difference in the moment that you're in and, and enlightenment. So absolutely. You know, I think one of the wisest things I've heard you say, and I've heard you say a few wise things over the years is um, you talked about the urgency of the now. And, and I think I always feel that it's important for us to remember the urgency of the now and never to to lose that. That now is important because it shapes tomorrow. Exactly. But I, also, I also remember you speaking and um, beautifully about you know the the myth of race because of course there there is only one race and it's the human race and it, the the notion that we belong to different races is a social construct that divides us. And hearing you say you know. In reality, we're going to still be talking about race in four generations. I'm not going to see the end of this argument. So it's that coupling of the, the sense of the urgency of the now and the realistic acceptance that we are not going to live in the perfect world. We're just aiming to make the world a better place than we found it. Absolutely. I think that, you know, my role in working with the issues of social justice you know, inequality, attempting to point us in the direction to deconstruct race it is my way of making a difference. But we all have something. But if and we all take one initiative, then we will be we will look reflectively on our progress. I sit where I sit today, not because of my parents or my grandparents. It was my great great grandparents who believed in something, who wanted something for the future. Of, of their people that were fighting and pressing towards something. So the urgency of the now is what do I do now to have impactful change, realizing that oftentimes seeing the change doesn't happen in my lifetime. Coretta Scott King says justice is never really won, it is fought and won in every generation. So, so how do we get to the future is doing something now, understanding that the future is beyond, the future is certainly tomorrow, it's in the next minute, but it is beyond us. How do we think of the urgency of now, but also realize the, the, the importance of delayed gratification? Yeah, absolutely, and getting there by a common ground. So I'm wondering, um, I think Ash is, well, I can see that she's on this call, and it's, you know, thanks for the event, Ash, it's really great. Um, how about some questions? I think you said you were going to curate some of them, pick some out. Yes, hi. Um, it's been such a great conversation between both of you. And if you don't mind, there are a few questions that the audience have raised that I would like to ask. Um, Please the do. first one is directed to um, Mr. Kifugi. Um, what do you think about the free markets displacing the democracy? Um, because these two systems could actually work together in synergy and well, actually you do the opposite work because in this free system, um, it's more of a, the equal, it's more of the votes being, when the votes are increased and that the weaker ones that are kind of removed. But in democracy, it's supposed to be every person's vote counts. So how do you think both of them can work together in order to better society? Well, <laughs> that, that, that's probably a bit more complex than what I can answer in these few moments that we have. What I will say mm -hmm. is that I think that they can both work together, but I think the most important place for to begin the conversation and the process is delivering the power to the people so that the people can decide what works best for them. Is that fair market based upon what the people want and what the people decide? I think it can certainly work. I think it can certainly work. You know, my first training is as an economist, so we could go down this entire path. But what mm -hmm. I want is for the power to rest in the hands of the people. And when that happens, for the people to decide. Now, that's a long journey of getting there because the people need to understand the whole basics of economics. And until you deliver that to the people, I don't even think we can have this fair conversation until they've been fully educated and informed. Mm, that's very good because education is key in order for us not to misunderstand each other and so we can all arrive to the same point together. And the next question is for both of you in which, how do you think ordinary people, what do you think they can do in order to go against the big power structures? Well, I think that ordinary people all over the world already are and forming common ground amongst themselves and critiquing 
power structures. Uh, in many cases, that's enormously constructive and enormously positive. Uh, and it's around things like, for example, climate change. Mm. I mean, there's been a fundamental shift in public perception of the urgency of these challenges over the last few years. And that's to do with self-organizing groups of citizens who have embraced the new technologies and used them to empower themselves. Um, I think that's a source of, uh, uh, for me, it's a, a source of optimism and of great hope. I, I really feel at the moment we're living in a world where a class of politicians across most of the world's democracies certainly are failing to realise that they are living through the biggest revolution in human history and it is the invention of the World Wide Web. It's the most rapid, far-reaching change in human history. It's affecting almost every area of life. There are now more people with access to the internet globally than there are with access to clean water. Mm. And, and that's becoming increasingly the case. Everybody is going to end up in our lifetimes with access to the means of production and dissemination of information. And that has enormous potential in terms of empowering the populations. This is why I think there is a deliberative wave. I think the OECD is right to talk about a wave of support for deliberative democracy. And I think some of the more traditional leaders of po political parties and what have you haven't quite realized that this is happening and it is it's going to keep up pick, uh, picking up pace. Well, I think that, can I use the reverend in my title for a second? I think <laughs> that the sin of the world is greed and that greed has put us into this place that has marginalized all concepts of equality. You know, Brian mm -hmm. Stevenson says that the opposite of poverty is not wealth. The op opposite of poverty is justice. How do we get people to the place of understanding what justice looks like for everyone? And that, you know, whereas people have obtained wealth in all kinds of incredible ways. And I know wealthy people who, who share their wealth you know, in all sorts of ways. How do we get ourselves focused on what does it mean to level the playing field economically so that there's running water in every community, so, so that no child is hungry, so that education equality exists for all? That's, that's justice. That, that is the eradication of poverty, not just like the dollars and cents, but how do we do that? And how do we think in that context? That's what I'd like to see happening in the world. You know what, Katie, you make me want to quote my father now. I've been quoted my mother. My father said to me as a, a young man, I don't want to be a richer man in the world. I want to be a man in a richer world. Yes, I've quoted him. Yeah. <laughs> That's very good. And um, moving on from that, since you said you're going to pull your reverend title a bit, I'm going to be asking um, some questions that kind of go into that direction. Um, in this ever-changing world that we're in, in terms of how scientifically we're globalized, we're going better, we're going farther, we're just, you know, new inventions coming in left, right. And then what do you think the role of religion will play in this future world where science is basically predominantly what we look at now? Well, this is a better question for my mother who's working on a book right now on technology and God. But I would say to you that as we are globalizing and with science and all of that, the core fundamentals of our faith does not, does not change. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in, in my uh, belief uh, as a Christian, I believe that the fundamental teaching is love and caring for one another and caring for the well-being of society. Um, and I believe that that has to spring forth in all of our faiths and that the divisiveness that we've seen around uh, faith and, and, and what we deem negative and can be negative in some faiths, that we have to turn to the positive within them as it relates to science, globalization, and understand what we have in common in all of those different traditions. And I believe that we will find, whether that is in Hindu or Islam, whether that is in Judaism or Christianity, whether that's in Yoruba or, or, or Akan, right? I think we will find that nestled in there is this ideal of love, love for each other, love for humanity. And I'm not, I'm not a man of faith, but um, I am a scholar who 
in my background was an expert on the, the French Enlightenment and the you know the European Enlightenment. Uh, and I would say that most of the great scientific thinkers of the 18th, 19th century were all people of faith. And that the, you know, the roots of most science are in mathematics that grew out of Arabia and you know the amazing traditions uh, that go back through generations. And in, in almost all cases, these people of great science and of great faith don't see any contradiction at all between the two. They're entirely commensurate with one another. In the minds of scientists of faith, their, their science is a gift from God to them mm. and enables them to create a platform for common engagement with one another. You know, the common language isn't the lingua franca of Latin, it's the lingua franca of algebra. <laughs> and, and, and so I will just add just 30 seconds and say to you, the entire construct of philosophy is, race, is based on deity of all these things. This is how we get the seats of knowledge that, where they began, right? So, but I think that what has caused the harm in this place, you know, my brother Richard says he's not a person of faith. And I say to him, every time I look at you, I see God, how is that possible, right? I think that the ideal of organized religion depleted the concept of something much larger. And we have to get back to that, which is larger, that cannot be defined, though we attempt to define it in our circuit texts and these other spaces. What I think that there's the divisiveness that we have to get beyond. What is central to all of us? There's something, air, you know, life, breath. I think that those are the core fundamental ideologies that are within faith that has to be brought forward. In, in all that we're doing and all that we're talking about. Yeah. Yes, I feel almost like those are very, oh, sorry. Well, you can I, go I, on. Uh, yes. I, was, I was just gonna yeah. say that, I think almost all the great people of science and religion that I've encountered in my life have all shared in common, whether or not they share a faith, a real humility. And you know, when they talk about science, they talk about science as being the current best bet, uh, the current best guess. You know, and when they talk about faith, they don't talk about absolute certainty, but about critical engagement with their mm. own faith. And it's that hunger to find um, common purpose that I, I find really empowering. Yeah, I was going to add, you, know, you really rounded off that really beautifully because for me as well, I, I'm a Christian and I'm also a scientist because um, I do study physiological um, sciences in Newcastle University. So um, when you said um, how most scientists, they see their faith and it's kind of like an, science is kind of like an expression of what their faith does tell them, well, just in a mere fraction. I really do, um, I really do get that because when I do go to uni and we do talk about different stuff in terms of like science and all of that, it's very, um, it just reconfirms my faith in general. And so what you said, um, Reverend Biggie, about division is that's, I feel like it's the um, issue that we have as a society. We tend, because we belong to one demographic, demographic or one group, we have to divide ourselves from the other, which shouldn't necessarily be the case. But instead, we have to work together in this synergy to create a better environment for everybody. And I just think that's a really, really valid point that in, not in terms of div divisiveness, but just to include everybody and there's this space for everyone to exist and to coexist very peacefully. But that was such a really good conversation. Um, I learned a lot, so I'm sure the audience do. And although we used to have some more questions, but it's just been very great talking to both of you. I've learned so much and I've opened my eyes and my ears to so many new prospects. And thank you so much for this conversation. You're welcome. I, I leave with you that when we all see ourselves as the other, mm. we engage with the other, we bring about impactful and meaningful change. Yes. Uh, I agree, hundred percent. And sadly, this conversation is going to come to an end. So thank you so much, Professor um, Richard McGee, and also um, Professor Keith McGee, sorry, and Professor Richard Clay. And um, now we're going to move on to our special performance by our friends, our Voice of Virtue Gospel Choir. So you can just always hop back in and hop in to kind of see the performance, and then we move there. So thank you thank so much. You. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank Bye. you. go to sleep in a troubled world I pray the Lord to keep oh, keep
keep hatred from the mighty and the mighty from the strong. Oh, heaven, help us all. Wow, that was special. What did you think? It was really good. It was such a nice, nice performance. Oh, gosh. Well, we had Rav Hesse with his beautiful music mm. and then two amazing speakers who I feel really touched by. And I also loved the discussion between you, uh, Rev Reverend Professor Keith McGee and Richard Clay. I thought that was really powerful. Mm, it was. Yeah. I really learned a lot from that. It's just what we're focusing now is on inclusiveness. We don't need to divide ourselves and we need to come together to coexist to make this world a better place for us and also those that will come after. So I think that's the main takeaway from this and I feel like we should all leave here with that mindset and then that'll be better. Absolutely, and we also had our lovely discussions about science and religion, mm. which I thought was really powerful. Yes. But, uh, and it was so nice to hear the gorgeous music uh, from the Gospel Choir, Voices of Virtue Gospel Choir. So we are honored and really touched that we could have that special end. Mm. But now we need to actually start our next session, which is all about cultivating curiosity. So we would like to introduce our next uh, official TEDx speakers to you. And we hope that they really help to stimulate your curiosity and unleash your imagination. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you.